This video contains spoilers of Twin Peaks up to Season 3, Episode 8. If you haven't finished this episode, please consider adding the video to your watch later queue. One word to describe the return of Twin Peaks is monumental. It is monumental in the way that color television was introduced after a monochrome display. In the 1990s, modern television changed in a way that molded narrative and development through its plot and characters in a continuous manner. David Lynch and Mark Frost presented Twin Peaks, a show that influenced so many of the shows we love today. It has been over 25 years and Twin Peaks has returned to make television history once again. However, this video won't be on how the original Twin Peaks series shaped television, but instead reviewing the show's return and go over its influential points. In this video I'll be reviewing the first half of Twin Peaks The Return series, in order from episode 1 through 8. I'll be analyzing various elements of the show's structure as well as the performances by the show's amazing cast. I will also score each episode at the end of their corresponding segment. I will score part 1 and 2 as a whole, the same goes for part 3 and 4, considering the duos aired the same date making the episodes connected. I am the old Tin Man, and if you are new to my channel, consider subscribing to find more Twin Peaks content. Click the bell icon to be notified when I publish a new analysis video. Keep an eye out for the second half of my review of Twin Peaks The Return. I'll be reviewing the last 10 episodes of the season then. I also want to welcome everyone to jump into the comments section down below to continue the Twin Peaks discussion. Thank you everyone for watching. Right away, we are reintroduced to Cooper 25 years after the last season, but there is a feeling of change in his character. Kyle MacLachlan has always gave his role as Agent Dale Cooper an original touch in the past series. In the new season, he completely redefined Cooper in the best possible way. Although we have only seen very little of the original Cooper in the new season, Kyle still makes Dale's personality very clear. Kyle's vague interaction at the beginning of the series as Cooper in the Black Lodge makes Dale's thoughts very mysterious, although the audience is absolutely going to support his end goal no matter what. What is great about the scene is how easily we have come to accept Dale's return, while disregarding what he had to deal with for 25 years. The audience hasn't perceived his 25 year imprisonment in the Black Lodge, so we are unaware of his survival in that quarter century. 25 years is a large portion of someone's life to be taken away without question. It's not like a prison sentence, this is the Black Lodge, a cryptic reality that is completely unordinary. At least prisoners can breathe the same air they have been breathing since they were born. I won't be surprised if we don't get a glimpse of Cooper's time in the Black Lodge before this scene. I also would like to note that this is the first time the viewers actually see the Black Lodge. In both the original series and Fire Walk With Me, we have only seen the Red Room and its hallways that connect to the Black and White Lodges. The giant, who is still nameless, presents a strange sound from the phonograph to the audience and Cooper. The giant tells Cooper to remember 430, as well as Richard and Linda, two birds with one stone. Although we might not have seen 430 in the series quite yet, it's possible we have already seen Richard and heard of Linda. I'll explain this further in the video. The real Cooper prepares to leave the lodge, but he comes to find out that he must wait for his doppelganger to return to the lodge. At this point, Cooper knows he needs to pursue his doppelganger, which makes Dale's goal a little more clear, although what exactly is Dale's intentions when he does catch up with him? We are unaware of his sanity since his stay in the Black Lodge. Could he try to kill him for revenge for trapping him and taking Annie away? Let's talk about Evil Cooper, the doppelganger that replaced his existence in the world at the end of Season 2. Must I tell you how much I completely love Kyle's role as Evil Cooper? It is utterly magnificent how well he portrays the opposing role of Dale Cooper. Evil Cooper makes such a believable threat to Dale and the world. He has grown a reputation as Mr. C and has been scheming his way to stay in the real world. He has grown connections with dangerous thugs, some who have interests to backstab him and kill him. Evil Cooper is introduced as a menacing villain who seems bulletproof, and has grown to understand the world around him due to his 25 year vacation. At this point of the story, we don't know his plans or how he got here, we just know he needs to be stopped. In the first two episodes, we find the storyline branching into various locations in the real world, an element that was slightly introduced in Fire Walk With Me. Fire Walk With Me introduced locations outside of Twin Peaks, such as the Fat Trot Trailer Park, which returned in the new season. In Season 3, the viewers are brought to both New York City, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Buckhorn, South Dakota. In New York City, the plot positions us in a skyscraper with a mysterious glass box, in which we slowly find that not only is the box questionable, it is dangerous. 
In Buckhorn, South Dakota, we are presented with a murder crime scene investigation. What's very interesting about this part of the plot is how closely these characters resemble ones from the original series. Many of the characters in South Dakota have an eccentric or witty personality, which allows the audience to have a different perspective of the show's strange universe. And of course, we have the town of Twin Peaks. Little by little, we have come to understand the original character's position in a new generation. Deputy Hawk has become more of a badass, and the Log Lady tugs at our heartstrings. So we must respect the Log. Hawk and the rest of the department must reveal what the Log Lady's message truly means to help get Cooper back to reality. At this point in the season, everything feels torn apart, which I think is a great way to reintroduce Twin Peaks. Everything is connected, but we aren't completely sure what it means to Cooper or the town of Twin Peaks. The viewer needs to put everything back together to understand and fully uncover the plot. I score part 1 and 2 a 5 out of 5, for an excellent return that allows the audience to, once again, peek through the red curtains into the Twin Peaks universe, but in the way that Lynch and Frost intended. The two-parter brings back the emotion we remembered from the original series, and creates something in which we have never seen before. With excellent direction, a passionate soundtrack, and a new intriguing story, the story starts off with a strong opening to the new series. After being presented with new locations in the world of Twin Peaks, we are also introduced in a new reality in which is connected to the Black Lodge, the non-existent universe. Being pushed by the doppelganger of the arm, the electric tree, or the talking brain on a couple of branches, Cooper falls into a void that lands him into a balcony that overlooks a purple sea. Dale finds his way through a dark room, where the frequency of the frames in that reality is extremely rapid and disorderly. The atmosphere of this place right away is sinister and unusual, which makes the scene exceedingly Lynchian and very creative. Lynch isn't new to the horror scene, as his debut film Eraserhead gave horror a new meaning with ominous and unexpected occurrences. In this particular scene, horror is brought to a new level of terrifying. A lonely and oddly quiet room with an eyeless woman builds anxiety in the audience, which allows us to experience the scene with Cooper. A tense limitation seems to set the theme in this outlandish room, as uncontrollable frame rate gives such an uneasy feeling to the audience. A monster waits outside the room eager to enter, and Cooper is rushed to exit before his entry. It seems the ones who occupy this room have an interest in helping Cooper, and seem to understand his situation. This scene took a great portion of screen time, with very little dialogue making a highly impressive outcome. Silence is a very uncommon element in television, and this scene executed it greatly. When a scene is silent, the visuals need to present some sort of interest to grab the attention of the audience. In this case, we are presented with unconventional camera work and direction that allows Cooper and the eyeless woman to pop on screen. David Lynch has been known to make strange circumstances in his work, but the scene has truly marked his horror theme perfectly. As for the light dialogue in the scene, we find Major Briggs' floating head announcing Blue Rose. Fire Walk With Me brought Blue Rose into question and since then, we don't fully understand what it truly means. We can only speculate that Blue Rose is code for an undercover case under Gordon Cole's direction. In part 3, a new Cooper is introduced as Dougie Jones, a manufactured body to fulfill a duty in which was successful in his switch with the real Cooper. It is already part 3 and audience has now seen Kyle MacLachlan take on 4 different takes on Dale Cooper. The good Dale Cooper, evil Dale Cooper, Dougie Jones, and now Dougie Cooper. It is here when most of us, including myself, were astonished by how many roles McLaughlin took in the new season. This is one of the most impressive performances I have seen in film. If he doesn't win an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor, I will literally cry. Kyle has been given an abundant amount of screen time in the new season, which has been very successful. Reintroducing various past characters to the show is somewhat of the appetizer of the season. We don't have a great portion of screen time with these supporting roles, but they make the show more appealing and complete. In some cases, we get a glimpse of their lives, or they are slowly brought into the story, making their roles more valuable. In Episode 3, Gordon Cole and Albert Rosenfield resolve matters at the FBI headquarters. We start seeing a connection between different storylines at this point. Tamara Preston explains the glass boxes, murderous spree, and how the FBI has been investigating this scene. Gordon is also informed that Cooper has been found after his mysterious departure years ago. Of course, the missing person in question is Evil Cooper, who escaped Twin Peaks 25 years ago. In these episodes, we are finally grasping the situation at Twin Peaks' sheriff's office. We come to find that Sheriff Harry Truman became ill and is in recovery, and his brother Frank has taken his place. Bobby Briggs has become a deputy with a change of heart, and Wally Brando, son of Andy and Lucy, is Michael Sarah. I score part 3 and 4 a 5 out of 5. 
for some of the best scenes in the series yet, such as the non-existent room in the introduction to Dougie Cooper. The performances of the original and the new characters have been some of the utmost portrayals yet. Just like part 1 and 2, these two episodes have been some of the most memorable in the season so far. Evil Cooper's plan is on everybody's mind, although we can't say what his end goal consists of. In part 5 we find Evil Cooper waiting patiently in his jail cell. While looking deeply into the mirror of the cell, the audience sees a quick memory that Evil Cooper looks back on. The last few moments of the season 2 finale, we go back to when Cooper was replaced with his doppelganger. After the flashback we return back to Evil Cooper's face, slightly shaping into Bob's, where he notes that Bob is still with him. As one of my favorite moments in the new season, the scene takes a dive into Evil Cooper's thoughts. At this point in the story, we haven't had a chance to delve into the point of view of Evil Cooper. Although the scene only lasts for a couple of minutes, it seems to be one of the most important sections of this episode. It almost feels that we are seeing the doppelganger's weak spot at this point in time. With the knowledge of Evil Cooper containing Bob's soul, we get to understand a little of what Evil Cooper's intentions are. The doppelganger might want to transfer Bob into another host to allow his soul to have further control. Overall, it was refreshing to see a different outlook in the series. Later in the episode, Evil Cooper shows how well he can control the environment around him. During his planned phone call, the prison alarm is set off and he simply says, the cow jumped over the moon. At the end of the call, the alarm shuts off and he waits patiently once again. Due to his unknown position, it seems that Evil Cooper has more control than we know of. In the Double R Diner, we discover a new character by the name of Becky. You remember Becky, she snorted a drug with her boyfriend and we found herself slowly panning away from her in the car. That specific shot felt essential, to show how her character feels invincible. We get the sudden feeling of how well she resembles Laura Palmer before her immediate demise. Becky showed a lot of the same characteristics of which Laura had, such as abusing drugs and having such a non-dreamy, troublesome boyfriend. Are we foreshadowing Becky's future this season? We also got to see the long-awaited reason why Jacoby was spray-painting those shovels gold. Only Jacoby can find himself in a situation where he makes gold <laughs> shovels. What a son of a I love you. We concluded the episode with a new location, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Another box in which has special elements that implodes after beeping. The beeping comes soon after Evil Cooper states how the cow jumped over the moon on his precious call at the station. Could this box control mechanical systems within the government's control? I score part 5 a 4 out of 5 for continuing to show more from Evil Cooper and allowing the audience to descend deeper into the doppelganger's character. We are also introduced to another location, which makes for interesting speculations. Although I wouldn't say a whole lot has been offered in this episode, but it did a great job following up and continuing the story after a great opening. This episode shows a great portion of Dougie's fixation on various objects. For instance, the statue's shoes and the officer's badge. We also see that Cooper is regaining some of his intelligence after being in a catatonic state for a good three episodes. He has also been able to slightly connect with Mike who appears to Cooper in some cases to nudge him in the right direction. On Dougie's case files, Cooper finds small sections of light that helps him connect unknown properties found within the files. Cooper also found similar occurrences during his visit to the casino in episode 3. An image of the Red Room appeared over various slot machines that would win on the next game. These events might be support from either Mike, the Arm, or the Red Room entirely. Cooper won 450000 at the casino, which is helping him pay off Dougie's debts with several gangs. The scribbles Cooper made in the case files allowed Dougie's boss to treat Dougie Cooper with more respect, perhaps helping him in the future. In this episode, Carl Rod in the Fat Trot trailer park returns after being introduced back in the feature film Fire Walk With Me. We see Carl taking a ride to Twin Peaks along with his friend Mickey, who both live in the Fat Trot trailer park. Richard Horn is also introduced in this episode as well. As a newcomer, we can only speculate that he's obviously related to the Horn family. He is shown to be a dangerous and a heartless individual, as he ran over and killed an innocent boy. Now let's go back to the first episode, where the giant explains to Cooper that he needs to remember 430, and two people named Richard and Linda. Richard might refer to Richard Horn. As for Linda, we come to find out that Mickey, Carl's friend, has a wife named Linda. 430 might seem to connect both Richard and Linda, but in what way? Let's go over some theories I have gathered together. There has been speculation that Evil Cooper impregnated Audrey Horn, which brought Richard into the world. Both Richard and Evil Cooper have one thing in common. They are evil. I score part 6 a 4 out of 5. 
for bringing in important character development to the story, which has been one of my favorite traits in the Twin Peaks series. We are able to see how well Cooper has been surviving as Dougie. We have been noticing small improvements to Dougie Cooper, which makes Kyle McLaughlin's performance much more profound. Diane was a surprising appearance in this episode and gave us a reason to look forward to her relationship with Cooper before and after the switch. As the most character engaging episode thus far, part 7 defines emotional connection between a large portion of the lead characters. We are able to form a better understanding of key events in the timeline between season 2 and 3. In part 7, an important piece of Hawk's puzzle back in Twin Peaks is presented. The pages found at the end of episode 6 brings a realization to Hawk that the good Cooper didn't return back to Twin Peaks 25 years back. This brings Hawk and the department's investigation in the correct direction. Doc Hayward explains Cooper's strange attitude after returning back from the lodge. Doc explains how he looked to be visiting Audrey Horn. It is here where evil Cooper could have impregnated Audrey, resulting in the birth of Richard. Perhaps the most impressive presentation of any character in this episode was Laura Dern's Diane. Not only is Diane's entrance to the series a pleasant surprise, but Dern's representation of Diane is a cornerstone to the story's development. Laura Dern's stern and headstrong depiction of Diane has shown how broken her character actually is. The conversation between her and evil Cooper has allowed us to sympathize with her and Cooper's relationship. In the original Twin Peaks series, we didn't see Diane, but instead saw how well Dale respected their professional relationship. In the autobiography of FBI Special Agent Dale Cooper, My Life, My Tapes, a novel by Mark Frost, Dale describes Diane as an interesting cross between a saint and a cabaret singer. There is even a deleted scene in Fire Walk With Me The Missing Pieces, where Dale flirts with the hidden Diane in front of her office. This is before the events of Twin Peaks. From all the evidence we have of both Cooper and Diane, we can say their relationship was cordial, as they both appreciated one another. The mood of Diane and evil Cooper in this scene shows the lack of trust Diane has in Cooper. The last she saw of Cooper is what altered her feelings toward him, a particular night at Diane's house. Diane's emotional outburst built a dark and painful scene to the audience of the last encounter between the two. A difficult and unforgiving situation has turned her against this mysterious Cooper. The impression I received from the scene was that evil Cooper sexually assaulted her, making Diane anxious and disturbed by the sight of him. Evil Cooper could have impregnated Diane and caused her to give birth to a monster child, much like Richard. It wouldn't be far off to say that Linda, the lady I explained earlier, is Diane's daughter. This makes both Richard and Linda siblings. Although we haven't seen Linda, but if she's Evil Cooper's child, she could have similar evil characteristics to Richard Horn. Evil Cooper might be scheming a series of impregnations to pass his evil genetics into the world, further securing his safety. Perhaps the giant was telling the good Cooper that Richard and Linda are the means of Evil Cooper's survival in the real world, making them his Achilles heel. As for 430 and the two birds with one stone references, the numbers could reference a date such as April 30th or a time that both Richard and Linda will come together. 430 could reference their flaw. Disposing the two might only be done in a way that needs both Richard and Linda together. This could be the only chance Cooper has to take out these satanic minions at once, which could reference two birds with one stone. At this point, Evil Cooper might become vulnerable, which could give Dale the upper hand. In Buckhorn, South Dakota, we discover the headless body is in fact Major Briggs, but in a younger form that died fairly recently. It looks as if Briggs has ventured through time and died of unnatural cause that led his corpse to appear years later. One of the most interesting moments of this scene is during the time Lieutenant Cynthia Knox has a call with Colonel Davis about the development in the case. Down the hall, we see a mysterious dark man, similar to the one floating away in the jail cell in episode 2. Lieutenant Knox seems to notice the figure walking her way, in which she concludes the call and walks back into the previous room. She doesn't acknowledge the mysterious figure, but instead ignores the situation. It could be possible that the mysterious man might appear hidden to the majority of society, except certain people such as the lieutenant. I don't think the security of this place lets any mysterious man walk into a facility like that. These dark individuals might be included in a secret Blue Rose case, where government officials have recognized their existence. Back at the Great Northern Hotel in Twin Peaks, an unusual ringing appears in Benjamin Horn's office. At the end of the scene, the camera slowly pans toward the walls of his office. Right away, it became apparent that the ringing could suggest that Josie Packard could still possess the wooden objects of the Great Northern. Although Josie was trapped in a knob after passing on in the final episodes of Season 2, she has been found in wooden objects from both Ben Horn and Pete Martell. Josie Packard's relationship to Ben on a business level was hazardous, with the both threatening one another through blackmail. Although what exactly is her reason to be in his office in that scene? 
the ringing seemed to appear around the same time Cooper's room key was returned to the Great Northern. Since this ringing seems to be noted as an uncommon noise in the Great Northern by Ben and his secretary Beverly, the ringing could possibly be responding due to the return of that key. That specific key has a significance to Josie, as it references Cooper's room, a place where she sealed her fate. It is in the doorway of Cooper's room where Josie shot Dale in hopes that he would die. Obviously, he didn't, and found that she was in fact the one that shot him in his room that day. It all concluded with a standoff with Josie, Harry, and Cooper, in which Josie mysteriously collapsed. At this point, Bob presented himself in the room, which shows how he is influenced by Josie's fear and possibly given the idea that Bob is responsible for Josie's fate. As Bob was shadowing Cooper, perhaps he was agitated with her for almost ending Cooper's life, which could have led him to trap her soul. Josie seems to be attached to the key, as it might be the way back to her original self, or to simply show how she still rests in the walls of the Great Northern. Although Josie's actor Joe Chin hasn't been slated to return to the new series, it would be a pleasant surprise to see Lynch cast her this season. I score part 7 a 5 out of 5, for being one of the best episodes this season by far. I can't begin to explain everything I love about this episode, as the show at this point has made an impact on the story's overall progression. From Hawk's team finally understanding Cooper's absence, to Dougie Cooper's badass karate chop into Ike the Spike's throat. This episode has shown much potential to the show's further development in the characters and storyline, which gives the audience a reason to continue the show. I've been really looking forward to reviewing this particular episode. To me, part 8 of Twin Peaks The Return will take place as one of the greatest moments in television history. This episode has some of the best cinematography I have seen on the screen thus far. Many of the scenes in this episode give such an emotion due to the camera work which is incredible. Lynch is known to make a passionate yet subtle approach when directing scenes. His work finds a realistic standpoint in an odd world, with long pauses and conversations. This unusual aspect makes a scene last longer, and if executed greatly, makes the scene more believable. This episode deeply expands the aspect of Lynch in the best way. This episode consists of very little dialogue, as we find ourselves seeing the Twin Peaks universe in a different viewpoint. It starts off with Ray shooting Evil Cooper, to accomplish his mission sent from the Phillips character. Many of the dark figures we have seen slightly in past episodes appear gathering around Evil Cooper's body. The episode credits these men as woodsmen, dark men that seem to come from the Black Lodge. The woodsmen rush to gather Bob's remains from the body to perhaps preserve it and place it in another host. Cooper's doppelganger wakes up after this ritual, in which he might not bear Bob's soul any longer. The timeline shifts to a time in which the first atomic bomb was detonated in White Sands, New Mexico. The date is July 16, 1945. Various images are displayed. One in particular shows a figure that closely resembles the monster from the glass box in Episode 1. The monster is vomiting a substance that looks like eggs, cream corn, or perhaps Garmin Bosia, with Bob's dark orb in the strange substance. Another scene that appears during this time is the convenience store that carries a similar appearance to the non-existent room with the eyeless woman in episode 3. The frequency in the frames is chaotic and presents a dark and unsettling display. The convenience store seems to be identical to the one shown in Fire Walk With Me, which is the gathering place for spirits who would meet to discuss Garmin Bosia. The man from another place, Mrs. Trimmond, her grandson, Bob, and the woodsmen are some of the spirits that have gathered here. All these images and scenes could be presenting the origins of Bob and how he associated with various spirits. The atomic bomb's explosion might have built the connection between the real world and the Black Lodge, allowing entry from the Lodge into the world. We return to the Purple Sea shown at the beginning of Episode 3, where we encounter the giant once again. An alarming noise alerts the giant and makes him look into the distant sea. It's uncertain where the scene lies in the timeline, as it could be right after the atomic bomb detonation or present time. Due to no notice of time changing, the alarm could be signaling a newly created door into the real world. On August 5th, 1956, 11 years after the atomic testing, we return to the New Mexico desert where a strange egg hatches a monstrous mosquito frog fly. Woodsmen also enter the desert in search for residents of the area, where they build fear and hypnotize the closest beings. One of the woodsmen enters a radio station where he kills reception and takes control of the radio announcer right before killing him. The woodsman announces a repeating phrase, which causes the listeners to fall unconscious. The monster bug creature enters one of the unconscious people, which makes me believe that the woodsman and the creature are associated with one another. The creature could possibly be the monster that evolved into the Bob we know now. The woodsman could have been helping Bob find a suitable host on the newly discovered world. The little girl could be the start of the murder spree of Bob. I score part 8 of 5 out of 5 
for being the most attention-grabbing episode and one of the best works from David Lynch. We have been waiting to know more about the events prior to Twin Peaks for the longest time, although we didn't expect to see anything else besides progression in the current storyline this season. This episode caught everyone by surprise and made such an imprint in Lynch's work that won't be forgotten. It feels as if this episode split the season in half as it seems the series has been building up to this point, giving us a different perspective on what's to come. As Evil Cooper has been resurrected with uncertainty of what he plans next, this could have flipped the game, giving Cooper a different goal. I don't think I could have ever expected such a transition like this, one that fits so well in the series. Twin Peaks has so much to offer this season. As the show has made history in the past, it has been making history once again. It's unusual to see a show return on television after a long break, and do as well as Twin Peaks, The Return. A show that returns to television where it continues its plot years later, finds trouble in entertaining old fans as well as a fresh new audience. But Twin Peaks The Return has brought back what we all loved about the show 25 years ago and made it enjoyable for newer fans. Let me know what you guys enjoy most about the show's new season, and what's your favorite episode so far. I really wanted to talk more about Blue Rose in this video, but I might want to dedicate a separate video for that topic. Let me know if that interests you. You might have also noticed I didn't go into full detail about Dougie, the glass box, and the brilliant musical score. If you are interested, take a look at my Twin Peaks playlist in the card above to go into further detail about those topics. I want to thank everyone for watching this Twin Peaks analysis. Don't forget to subscribe and do you guys want me to make my second half review once the show ends. Thank you once again, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you.